Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. We are in Kitisa today. When you elevate or when you take the census or take a count or a sum of the people of Israel, they were to do so in a manner that would help provide atonement for them. The thing is, though, we're, we're not going to go so much into that part of the Parsha today. We're going to jump forward a little bit in what's going on here. Uh, Moshe, up on the mountain, talking to Yahweh, and, and he's receiving further instruction from Yahweh for all the people of Israel, and he's talking about atonement. He's talking about uh, pr providing for the people, the people providing for the service of the Mishkan, you know, the, uh, the, the half shekel that was given would help the function daily of the tabernacle it, it, to help it continue to to move to uh, uh to to buy the offerings the sacrifices and to have what they needed and to care for the levites and to make sure that every day it had what it needed to function and this was having a reciprocal relationship with yahweh through the tabernacle it's they were providing for the means to have his presence with them and then obviously he was with them they would benefit right but something interesting happens in this week's Parsha. While, while Yahweh is talking to Moshe, talking to him about uh, atonement and, and all of these things that Yahweh desired for Israel, Israel lost sight of Yahweh. Hard to do, isn't it? I mean, here they are. They're at the foot of the mountain. We have the, the thick cloud, the smoke, the fire, the thunders, the lightnings. All this is going on. I mean, they see Yahweh's on the mountain. But the question wasn't really, as we go on and we read, well, Yahweh's obviously not with us anymore. No, he's right there. The question they brought forward was, we don't know what happened to Moses. Hmm, interesting. Because they were to put their trust in Yahweh. They were to put their trust in him. He is the one who redeemed them. He is the one who brought them out. He is the one who was leading them into the land. But they took their eyes and put it on Moshe. Here, Moses, we don't know what's happened to Moses. And so they start to form and fashion within themselves what they need to do next. We don't have Moshe here with us. What do we do now? And, and so we'll cover this a little more a little later. But what we find is that they start to develop a means to cope with themselves in their current situation. And it's not good. They start to develop a way where they can see that, okay, Yahweh's on the mountain, but he's right here in the camp. Hmm. But they were doing things that Yahweh had instructed them not to do. Let's take a look at it and, and, and see, what, uh, see what we're looking here. Okay, Exodus 32, 1 through 5. So when the people saw that Moses delayed from coming down from the mountain, they gathered all around Aaron and they said, Get up, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. So Aaron said to them, break off the golden rings that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden rings that were in their ears and they brought them to Aaron, verse four. And he received them from their hand and made a molten calf fashioned with a chiseling tool. And then they said, look at this. This is your God, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And then verse five, when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation saying, tomorrow will be a feast to Adonai. Now we read literally in the Hebrew, Vayomer, and he said, Ag, a feast, a festival, le Yahweh Mahar. So tomorrow. The interesting thing we see here, first off, uh, is that when Aaron made this golden calf, he did fashion and form it in this manner. And the people made this declaration. This is Elohim who brought you out of the land of... Now, did they really think that this calf that everybody saw was just made, this is the one who brought them out of Egypt? No, I, I, I don't think so. I, I believe they were trying to make a representation of who they believed him to be and fashioned what they knew into an object that they could relate to. And then said, we're going to worship Yahweh by means of something we understand, by means of this golden calf. This is how we're going to worship Yahweh, who led us out of the land of Mitzrayim. And Aaron takes it a step further by say, saying, here right by this golden calf, tomorrow we will hold a feast, to, I don't know, we will hold a feast to Yahweh. The Chag is the word there to use for festivals, especially like the, uh, the three-foot festivals that you go to Jerusalem to, to observe. So this is the same word that's used there. 
And Ahag also relates to uh, the word for circle or cycles. So we have circles and cycles uh, going in here as well. So there's a lot that's going on that we could go into. Uh, really not going to examine every single avenue here today, okay? But what we are going to take a look at is uh, how did they fashion this calf and what did they mean to do and what did they actually do and what does that, that mean for us? Okay, so let's take a quick look here. First off, we need to understand that we need to worship Yahweh the way that he said to worship him. Moshe was receiving direction and instructions from Yahweh about how to approach him, how to live with him, how to dwell with him, how to have him within us, how to have him in our camp and in our homes and to live life as a holy people set apart. And the people got anxious. They got tired of waiting. I say, it's been 40 days. We don't know what's happened to this man, Moses doesn't mean anything. Yahweh was still there, right? But we don't know what's happened to Moses, we, a relatable figure that we can talk to, that we're not having to talk directly to Yahweh. We can talk to Moshe to see what Yahweh has to say. We want a representative, okay? Something that we can relate to. So what's going on here is the people said, we don't know what's happened to Moses. So obviously he's either dead or he's just not doing anything because we can't see him. So Moses isn't here to give us God. So they go to Aaron and they say, Aaron, you make us God to go before us. And that's where a lot of problems come in, isn't it? When we start to try to fashion our idea of who Yahweh is to go before us, and that leads to a lot of problems. I mean, that can lead to a lot of uh, expectations in who we think Yahweh is that he never said he was. We start expecting him to do things for us that he never said he was going to do. We expect things to happen in our life the way that we think it should go according to the God that we serve. Problem is, we fashioned that God, and uh, that's not Yahweh. So we have to be careful about how we approach him and how we listen to the things that he is telling us. Don't fall into the same trap that Egypt, or when they came out of Egypt, that, that they did. They set up their own idea of who Yahweh was and then worship the idea. See, they, we have to be careful that we don't do that. Uh, they took their knowledge. They took their ideas, the life, everything that they learned in Mitzrayim, and they adapted that into the worship of Yahweh. And what we find is Yahweh telling them more, more than once, the land I'm taking you to, the people are wicked. Don't do the things they do. And the place where I brought you from, don't do the things that they do, which kind of leads a void, right? If we can't do everything I've always ever known, and I can't do the things that I see the people in the land that we're going to, what do I do? And that is why Yahweh was giving his instructions to Moshe. He was telling him how to live with him, how to live holy, how to uh, be uh, pleasing, walk the right path, right? And so... People didn't want to wait, right? And, and we have warning after warning after warning. Uh, Deuteronomy 12 tells us, uh, Yahweh is going to cut off the people before you. You will dispossess them. But be careful that you don't follow after them after they've been destroyed. How can you follow after them after they've been destroyed? Well, by what they leave behind. And, uh, and don't say, well, well, let's look to see how they did everything so that we can do everything exactly like they did. No, it's, we don't do that. We don't worship Yahweh that way. He tells us how to approach him, much like the plan for the tabernacle. He tells us the plan for approach. You have to go in through one gate. There's only one way in. You go in through that gate. You go to the altar. That's where the sacrifice goes. That's where the korban goes. The thing that is brought near to Yahweh, the thing that is presented to him. Then the labor. You have to wash the hands and feet. Then, then forward in to the holy place. And, and all the all the items that were in the holy place and then up, up towards the most holy place, the altar of incense there. Uh, and then as you go inside, of course, you have the ark and everything in there. So again, there was one way to approach. You couldn't approach him just however you thought. You couldn't skip the steps either. So again, Yahweh is trying to teach us he is holy. We can approach, but we have to do it the right way. Right? That's why we find things like Psalm 25, 14, that says, Yahweh is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. 
He teaches us his ways. Why? Because we reverence him. We are in covenant with him, so he will teach us what that covenant is. And that's a step-by-step, day-by-day process. We're learning every day, right? So back to our story here. What happens? Exodus 32, 7 and 8. Yahweh says to Moshe, go down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Like, don't you think it's kind of funny how uh, this conversation goes? You know, it's kind of like, a, you know what your kid did today kind of a thing, right? So he always talking to Moshe is like, you know what your people are doing? <laughs> funny. When Yahweh is saying, I've set you apart to be a holy people. You are my people. I will be your God. But when they turn away and turn aside, right? He's saying, you're not acting like my people. This was not the covenant we entered into. You're following your own ways. Okay. So let's keep reading. Verse eight. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them, and they have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Look at that. They have turned aside quickly from the way that I have commanded them and made this golden calf to worship. He didn't say they're worshiping me through this golden calf because he said you don't worship me that way. You don't set up an idol and worship me that way, even though the people could have very well thought, well, that's what it means to me. I think the question really is, what does it mean to him? See, and that's where we have to stop and take a really good look at it. Are the things that we do, especially in relationship uh, to the word and and Yahweh himself, and uh, I hate to use the word, but you know, our religion, everything that we do, is it because, well, that's what it means to me, or is it because of that's what it means to him? That's what it means to Yahweh, the God that I serve, the creator of heaven and earth and everything in it. See, that's what happens. Because if we try to start to do things our own way, then we are by default putting a veil over our eyes of our own doing so that we do not see what Yahweh desires for us to see. And that veil can only be removed if we honestly and truly come to him. Now, where do we get this idea from? Okay, so the word for golden calf is in the Hebrew is Egel Masacha. Egel Masacha. The word Egel means calf, but it's exactly the same spelled as the word Agol, which means round, circular, or cycles. So they made a representation of this calf that can also represent cycles, circles, something is round like this. They turned aside from the path quickly that Yahweh had commanded them, and they desired to make their own way to make their own cycles, their own circles, their own path. They wanted to make their own way and say they're doing it for Yahweh. How many things are done in the name of God that are not things that he said? See, and, and unfortunately, people judge the, you know, Yahweh himself based on his people. And that's not fair uh, because People can be corrupt. People can can be pulled aside. But Yahweh is holy, holy, holy. We're not a perfect people. But yet, He is calling us to Him every day. He is renewing us every day, giving us the chances and the opportunities to live for Him and to, be, have, and to have a life that honors Him every day. See, He is faithful. He is gracious. He is compassionate. And even though we make mistakes, he offers forgiveness and he, and he, he does bring us to him and he wants us to continue in the path that he has set for us. But what happens here? Let's go back to this. What happens here with the golden calf? So also implies a face covering or something that is hiding the true face. The word masacha that's used there for molten also means a veil or a covering. We see this in Isaiah 25, verse 7. It says, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering. Look at that. The covering cast over all the people and the veil, that's the word masacha, that is spread over all nations. So there is a veil that is spread over all the nations because of the deception in their own life. What they are fashioning, they're serving idols, they're in idolatry. But if they turn to Yahweh, he will remove that veil. Interesting uh, thing we've seen from Ephraim Frank, I'm gonna quote here. It says here, the backsliding Israelites who are so desperate to see with their eyes actually suffer a loss of sight 
as they are blindfolded by a masacha, a veil of their own making. They didn't see Moshe to testify for Yahweh, so they wanted what they could see. Moshe is not here to testify for Yahweh and to tell us what Yahweh is saying, so we're going to make something that we can see, so that way we can follow it, right? You know, kind of like now they want to play follow the leader. You know, after all this time, Moses, you let us out here to die in the wilderness. Moses, why'd you bring us out here, right? Moses, the Egyptians are coming after us and we're at the water. What's going on, right? Now that Moses is gone, they're like, where's Moses? What's he, what are we going to do now? <laughs> no, see, we learn it's not Moses they were following. It's Yahweh they were following. And, and they needed to learn that as well. It was Yahweh that they were following. And, and Moshe was relaying what Yahweh was saying, but only because the people backed off when Yahweh spoke. They couldn't stand to hear it. Everything that they expected, everything that they thought, Yahweh says, I'm coming down to meet with you in three days. Get ready. And the people said, okay, we're ready. And guess what? They weren't. And so the people got scared and they were afraid and they backed off. He said, Moses, you go find out what God says, and we will do it. Moses goes to find out what Yahweh says, and in the process, you know, they had declared, everything Yahweh has said, we will do, we will be obedient, we will hear it, we will do it. And as they're waiting, they build a, they build a calf. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? But that is the way people are. And in this void that we create, we fill it with what we want. Hmm. So that we can so that we can observe our own desires and try to justify it by saying it's God, right? We see this as well. Again, um, look here. Follow the leader. This is what I have here. The last promise that Israel received from Moshe. Consider this. The last promise that Israel received from Moshe before going back up on the mountain was that Yahweh would send them a messenger to lead them. We see this in Exodus twenty three twenty. It says, "Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way, and to bring you into the place that I have prepared." So Yahweh says, I'm going to send you a messenger. So in the perceived absence, I'm not going to say in the absence of Moshe, because Moshe was not absent. He was there on the mountain. But in the perceived absence, we don't know what's happened to him. We don't know what he's doing. He must be doing nothing. So let's do what we want. See? So in, in, in his perceived absence, they created this messenger that was promised to them and put their own terms on it. And then got up to uh, to eat and drink as as and make offerings before it as we did see earlier on the mountain right when moshe declared these are the the words of the covenant in accordance with the book of the covenant this is the blood of the covenant right all this in together that moshe declared for the people we see them kind of mimicking here but they take it a step further and let's just say the scripture says they uh they got up to play they got up into revelry and uh it wasn't good all right, they got into all kinds of, of, of crazy things. Joshua said there's sounds of war in the camp. It was, it was uh, horrendous. But uh, Moshe was like, no, that's not war. The people are, are they're having, they're having a, a party that's way out of control. Yeah, and then you don't honor Yahweh like that. So again, so this was what this is what they did. So what is another time that we see in history, Israel's history, where the golden calf was set up to try to show some what someone desired. How about Jeroboam? We know the story. Okay, if you go back, you read about Jeroboam and Rehoboam, you see the kingdom was divided into the northern and the southern kingdom, the ten tribes to the north, the uh, two tribes to the south, because uh, Rehoboam was harsh to the people. They went and the people came to him and asked for a, a reprieve, and he said he would make life harder on them. And then the, uh, the prophet went to Jeroboam and says he, the part kingdom is going to be brought away from Rehoboam and he will have 10 parts of it. Well, they did that. And so the Northern kingdom is here and the Northern kingdom ends up going into idolatry. And that's why they ended up being dispersed into all the world. But what happens here really? And interesting enough, <laughs> as we read the story, he sets up a golden calf and makes direct reference to the sin of the golden calf after they came out of Egypt. You would think that he would have known better. But what he did, he looked at the scripture and, and he, he got counsel from the people around him to, to do this because it's what the people would want. And if you don't, you're going to lose control of your people. Oh, see, that's really it, isn't it? They, what, what does it look like? What happens here? Let's, let's take a look at it. First Kings 12. 
Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If this people keep going up to offer sacrifices in the house of Adonai at Jerusalem, then the heart of these people will turn back to their Lord, to King Rehoboam of Judah, and then they will kill me and return to Rehoboam of Judah. So the king sought counsel and made two golden calves. And he said to them, you have been going up to Jerusalem long enough. Here are your gods, O Israel. Look at the phrasing who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And then he set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Check it out. This is amazing. Here he says, if the people go to Jerusalem for the festivals, then they're going to end up serving Rehoboam and going back and, and living there. And, and I'll lose my kingship and my life because they're, they'll kill me and then they'll come go back under Rehoboam because they're going back to Jerusalem to worship God. Wow. See, so in turn, he sets up two golden calves, one in Beth El and one in Dan. Amazing, isn't it? And he tells the people that here, this, this is the, 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 the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Same thing that the people declared at the foot of Mount Sinai. We are creating an image of Yahweh that you can relate to. Not who he said he was, not who he wants you to be in the relationship. We're going to make an image that is familiar to you. And that way you can serve God here. And then he goes through and by enticing him this way, then he starts to create other festivals and change the dates of these things. See, it was luring away. And because of the idolatry, Israel was dispersed into all the world. What I'm getting at here is be careful that we don't fashion and make a veil over ourselves about what we feel Yahweh wants for us. In, in the absence of, of direct, I don't know exactly how to, how to say this, but in, exact, in, in the absence of direct instruction, we kind of speculate. And so be careful that we're not just speculating, this is what I want to do. And I'm going to say that God told me to do it because it's what I really want. <laughs> no, we need to go back and approach the word and see, what, see how he's leading and to see what he's telling us. And when we approach, our eyes will be opened. The veil will be removed. Much like when we read through the Torah, that veil is removed if we truly have our heart turned to Yahweh. We see in 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 18, it says, What is more, their minds were made stone-like, for to this day the same veil remains over them when they read the Old Covenant. It has not been unveiled, because only the Messiah is the veil taken away. I want us to note, the veil is taken away, not the instructions, not the Torah. The difference is the person reading the Torah, not the Torah. The words don't change. So they can't say, oh, well, I'm just worshiping you know, God in my own way. No, because his word did not change. You don't do that, right? Let's keep reading verse 17. So Adonai in the text means spirit, and where the spirit of Adonai is, there is freedom. So all of us, look at this, with faces what? Unveiled. See as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and we are being changed into his very image from one degree of glory to the next by Adonai, the spirit. And that's it. When we turn towards him, the veil starts to come off of, off of our lives and we can see what he's wanting for us to see in the word. Then we can apply it. Then we can live it. And then we can show it in, in, in a day by day uh, life. And that is how we have his presence dwelling with us. That is how we avoid making golden calves. We trust Yahweh and his word. And we trust that he says, I, I want to live in you and through you. I want, the, I want you to show me to the people around you. And we do that by just uh, surrendering, by just surrendering. And even, even those times when we feel tempted to make a golden calf, <laughs> don't do it. Surrender to Yahweh, not the inclination to make a golden calf, right? Don't set up things that Yahweh said uh, to avoid. So that is uh, what we really got for you today. Kind of, kind of short today, but uh, I hope it still brings some encouragement to you. I hope it still challenges you as well. And that's how we change, right? We don't change unless we are challenged. So I hope this brings some encouragement to you. I hope this brings some, some challenge to you. 
And I hope that, uh, that as we do this together, that we can show there's a better way. Uh, people are watching you. So let's, let's let, yeah, let's let them see Yahweh in our lives. Okay. So if this has been a blessing to you, uh, we ask that on whatever platform you watch, whatever, or you watch, or you hear, you listen, whatever it is, share it, help get this, help get this word out there, help share these teachings and get them out there. And if this has been an encouragement to you, uh, would you consider making a donation as well to help us to continue to make these and, and to keep these videos coming out there. Okay. We appreciate all the prayers and your support. And, uh, so please continue to do so. And so with all of that, I pray that you guys have a blessed week as you continue to study this Parsha and we'll see you next week. So until next time, Shalom.